I, I thank you all for having me here today. And I, uh, your father and I talked last week about the essence of your organization and, and what I might do today to share with you my thoughts on what I call giving back. Because I think that's really what defines us really truly successful. I, I've, I've implored the editors of Fourth Magazine to stop writing that terrible issue that has no redeeming value with a list of people with the most money. Or unfortunately, I've been inhabited for the last six or seven years. And I've urged them instead, if you wanted to do some real good, why don't we have a list of who does the most for charity? Not just in terms of dollars and cents, but also in two other forms of charity. Yourself and your thoughts. I think one of the greatest acts of charity all of us can do is kindness of thought about others, especially our enemies. I had an interesting experience. I, I am, I'm in the early stages, Jimmy, of getting involved with Rudy if he runs for president. And last week, we were talking about how we're going to put together this team across the United States. Wayne Heisinger in, in Florida, Bernie Marcus, we have Bernie Marcus in Georgia. Uh, he, he volunteers me, so I volunteer him. You know. And then I was told, and we have Mike Milken in California. Now, if you'll remember, Mike Milken was, I want you to, I think Mike Milken was almost one of as much as other people were more recently by Rudy Giuliani. And I thought, when I heard this, I thought, what a wonderful gesture of charity. And I let Mike know that. I hope that I always have the capacity, which unfortunately I don't, I hope I always have the capacity to forgive my fellow man, especially when there's hate in my heart. And I think if, if that's the one thing we all brought to any exercise, there wouldn't be wars and there wouldn't be the need for nuclear weapons. But unfortunately, humanity is not put together that way. But, so I, I define giving back in three forms your treasure, your talent, and your kindness. And I want to relate to you one story that both embarrasses me and makes me so proud. <clears throat> and I always watch from, from my having been on the GE board, I always watch NBC, and I always did before because Jack and I are very close friends and I had loyalty, I'd always watch NBC News. And one cold winter night, about 11 years ago, I was watching uh, ABC News, and there was a fellow by the name of Arnold Diaz, and he had a piece called War of Shame, and he would feature people who ripped off people. And this one night, he talked about this charlatan, this man lost, poor man lost, had the house burned down out in Long Island, out around Bay Shore. And the charlatan showed up and said, if you give me your insurance proceeds, I'll rebuild your house. So the poor guy had an $80,000 policy, and he gave him the $80,000. And Arnold Diaz is now there, and there's a few two-by-fours coming out of, the, out of the ground, nothing else. And what happened was the guy went back and said, well, I spent you 80000 This is as much as I can give you 80000 This man had eight children. He was living in a 48-foot trailer with his wife and eight children. He had... No running water, no lights, no heat. And this is now late October. And I thought to myself, how terrible. I proceeded to put the light out and go to sleep. And this is truly an act of God. Six weeks later, probably the next time I was watching Channel 7, Arnold Diaz is back on television again. And this time he's talking about this wonderful act of charity, this wonderful act of love of people towards people. And I do a second look, and I see a whole bunch of people. He's now in front of this house that's really going up. And this huge man with his eight children and his wife. And in back, I notice 
But all these people working had orange aprons on. And Arnold Diaz said, told the following story, that that night that I watched the show, one of our hourly associates, some poor kid probably making 11 or 12 bucks an hour then, saw the same thing I did. I put the light out and went to sleep. He kept the light on and went to work. I almost break up when I tell the story. The next day he went to his store manager and said, we have carpenters, electricians, plumbers, and so forth, and work for us. He said, if I can put together a team of people that have all these different craft talents, can we get some help from the company for the building materials? And each store has a limited budget, and this store manager networked. He went out, we had a number of stores out in Long Island. He got each of these different stores to do what they could do within their budgets. And now here we are, with this man seeing this house being complete. And Arnold Diaz puts a microphone in front of this man. And he said, well, what do you think? He said, well, you know, he said, I always believed in God. But I didn't know he wore an orange apron. <laughs> and I, I got to tell you, there was enormous joy for me that we had built a club culture that allowed this. But there was great shame on my part that with my enormous wealth and my intense connections, especially in Home Depot, that I did nothing. The opportunities to give back are all around us, every day, every week, every minute. We can go out in the street right now and I can stop 15 people. And trust me, every one of them has a hurt. I, I remember I was going to Mass out in Nassau County out in the St. Mary's one morning and I used to make the 703 train and we used to go to 6.30 Mass and then run over to the station. The one thing about the Mass that was great, it was 20 minutes and you had time to get to the station. <laughs> of course, the one thing about the great about any Mass, I accuse you of being a Jesuit because we have a Jesuit priest that comes and says Mass at St. Peter's on Sunday mornings and I'm out of there by 7.30. A late mass is five minutes to eight. <laughs> My kind of guy. Okay. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this priest gets up, and now we don't have sermons during the week. Normally, you don't have sermons. He's not going to say Pat at seven o'clock. It was very short. And this fellow gets up, and I say, "Oh my God!" He announces first of all that he's the brother of a woman who lives in Manhasset. He's from Minnesota. I'm going, "Oh my God!" We're going to get a, a real evangelical. 30 minute sermon on those two trains, not one. And he gets up and he says, my sermon is very simple. Every roof has a leak and every heart has an ache. The opportunity for each one of us to do something for somebody else is all around us however we want in whatever form we choose to do it. I think, I think in, the, in my case, I can only speak about myself, uh, I, if you were to look at what my wife and I do financially, you'd have to conclude that we are, quote, very charitable people. I would argue that we aren't. And the reason I would say we aren't is because to write those checks, we give up absolutely nothing. I live in wonderful homes, my wife has good taste, and She's never managed not to exceed an unlimited budget. <laughs> uh, she understands about giving to either the contractors or the charities. <laughs> she's, she's consistent, but, uh, but I give up nothing. Uh, when you talk about time, I can honestly God say I'm sacrificing. I'm sacrificing reading a good book playing a bit around a bad golf, I'm not in Jimmy's league, you know, if I can take it around 30 shots more than he does, it's a home run, it's very dead. <laughs> uh, I can think of all the things I can do, I might do another deal, which I love doing, I still love doing, whatever. But when I, when I sit and give time, I'm sacrificing. When I sit and I extend kindness, to somebody I don't like, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, a ch I'm, being ch I'm extending myself. <clears throat> the Bible says too many times, <clears throat> if you're only good to people that you love, that's not enough. That's not enough. 
It's when you extend yourself to those people that it's hard to like or difficult to like. Well, you have to make a conscious effort to smile. It's amazing. The irony of it is how much better I feel about me. Not what I might have done for them, but how I feel about me. And it's the waiter. It's the bus boy. It's the cab driver. It's the toll seller in the, in the subway. All those people. But if you do nothing more than extend a smile in what might be an otherwise bleak day for them, not by their occupation, but perhaps by an event or a tragedy or a misfortune in their family or in their own lives, whatever it is. I, I, I think I'm a pretty good salesman. At one time, a guy said to me, how would you define salesman? And I would think that there are three things that I think work. A kind word, a thoughtful gesture, and enthusiasm. And I think too often, all of us in our busy days, all of us, let's face it, we all want to get rich, we all want to make a lot of money, we all want the good things in life. That's why we work so hard, that's why we spend so many days and months and years away from our families, because we want to hit the long ball. But you got to come back to reality. And reality is we live in a single world, and, and if there's hurt, and there's misfortune, and we don't do our share for it, I submit to you, you haven't given back. One of my, one of my great heartbreaks, and I'm happy to tell you we're winning this war, but one of my great heartbreaks, I'm on the board of Ronald McDonald House up here in, on 73rd Street. We have 82 rooms, always full. In fact, we're so full that we're about, we're, we're embarking on a major program we're going to build. We bought the land over by the 59th Street Bridge, and we're going to build 142 rooms there. And we'll give this place up we have for probably senior citizen retirement. Uh, extortion is bad only when you do it for selfish reasons. Extortion is good when you do things. So I'm, I'm presently extorting McDonald's as hard as I can about the value, the naming rights of the value of the top of that building. If, if they can get a hundred million dollars for a stadium that you only use once a week, when you've got 450,000 cars a day going over a bridge and everybody's going to see that thing, I would think it has some marquee value. So uh, with pain and with pleasure, we're doing what we can, but the point is, I go to that house, and I see these little kids with no hair. The good part of the story is, 10 years ago, we lost 70% of them. They'd go home and die. And the great part of the story is we flipped that ratio. Today, 70% go home and live, and we're getting there. We're winning a big time. That's the battle we're winning. So I can take you any place you want. I can take you up to my charter school in Harlem where I have 11-year-old kids that can't count to 20. Eight-year-old kids that can't tell you the difference between red and blue and green. A 13-year-old girl that has to go home. She can't stay for after school work. Our school runs, we run from nine to five, uh, from eight to five every day. We're open on Saturdays and it's the 11-month school year. We're trying to force feed these little tykes into catching up. They're on average behind three grades when we get them. This little 13-year-old girl has to go home because she's got to pick up her 18-month-old sister from a daycare and babysit her until her mother comes home from work. It's all over. It's all around us. How we can live well and enjoy all of the great luxuries and joys and features of this great city and see this all around us and do nothing about it is wrong. I submit to you, it is morally wrong. And yet, the sense of charity that we all should have, that too many of us don't have, can only be fixed by example. So the old saying, to them that much is given, much is expected, works. Uh, I, I have no doubt, I have no doubt, that whatever success I've had, and I leave it to others to measure success. Too, too frequently, and sadly too many times, we measure success by the size of a person's net worth. 
or his possessions. And I would submit to you that would be the last thing I would want to be measured by. I'd rather be measured by the father that raised sons that have a great need to give back. I don't want to embarrass my son as he with me today. But he, he carries in Vietnam two orphanages financially. You don't read about it, you don't hear about it. He goes over there a couple times a year and when he goes back with these pictures, what you want to do is cry. I, 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 I say to you that the true essence of charity is yourself, not your wallet. Part of that's historic on my part. So let me tell you what I mean. <clears throat> father, I don't mean to offend you. I told you the story about my father. My father was a plumber. The Catholic Church used to have a horrible practice. <clears throat> For the Easter and the Christmas collections, two or three weeks after the holiday, they used to print a list of who gave what. My dad was always at the bottom of the list. <clears throat> but I can tell you that what he gave, he went without something to give. And that always has been in my mind, and one of the reasons that my wife and I, as much as we can, we try to do what we can do, as low a profile as we can. My, my great lament in my publicity of these past three years, which I can assure you I didn't see, as I said to Jimmy, all I did was give Dick McGrath some a modest raise, and here I am in everybody's <laughs> newspaper. But my great lament is that my fo people focus on what my wife and I do financially, and that's wrong. My wife is very active at the Boys Club of New York, very active. She took it unto herself to revive the journal, and we had the Boys Club dinner last week, and I think, I think it was doing, the journal was doing thirty dollars or $40,000 a year. She's up to $300,000 a year, just the journal. Every single friend I have, including Jimmy Dunn, gets hit, and if you people give me your business card, she'll call you too. To try to get <laughs> and, and we go to our home in the mountains in North Carolina in August, and she sits by that phone. And she dials for dollars. She's a much better golfer than I am, and she's certainly much better looking than I am. That's not and much more popular than I am. <laughs> much more popular than that. I am. So she can be doing a lot of things with the time. But there she is, dialing for dollars. And it's, you know, she has the Animal Medical Center. We have the Animal Medical Center dinner tonight. Let me tell you about that place. You'd be amazed at how many people in this city, old people, they're only linked to life. Is the parakeet they have, or the cat that they have, or the dog that they have, or the little gerbil, or whatever. <clears throat> that's, that's the only notion they have that life goes on. And so many of those, poor, those old people haven't got the money to take care of those animals. And you want to go to the animal medical sometime, center sitting there, and look at these old people with their dogs and their cats and whatever they have. And thank God there's kind, charitable people. So it's not about the animals. It's got it back to people. It's back to people. I can, I can show you any place you want to go. Hurt, deprivation, cruelty. And if people like us, who eat in these wonderful, wonderful clubs and restaurants and dress so wonderfully and live in fine homes, if people like us don't understand the need to give back. But I challenge you, less with your checkbook and more with you. Because let me tell you why I say that. I've never had a case yet where I couldn't engage somebody where they've got money. It's a bit of a trick, but it works. That if you engage them, how all of a sudden the wallet opens up. So if we can engage people to have a passion for a cause, I don't care the cause, you pick the cause. But if we can have a passion for that cause, if we can say to people, you in your own little way, today, if the good Lord calls you tonight and say, today, I made the world a wee bit better for somebody else. That's the beginning of the process of charity and of making the world indeed a better place for other people. I, I was out in Long Island last week, and they have this Tommy Award that I was blessed to be selected to receive. This is Tom Hartman, 
and, and, and the rabbi Mark Gelman. And I said, and I still think, and I think to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if people of all faiths, because we all, if you have a faith, that means you believe in God. Now, unless your God is different than the God I believe in, the God I believe in talks about kindness and compassion and loving and giving and caring and forgiveness. If we all have that same endpoint, then there's got to be a way that we can work our differences out without murder, without war, without disease inflicted on each other by how we do these things. But that's the challenge, and I would, I would say to you, every person in this room today is here because you bring something to the party. Hopefully, for I said I'd make a pitch for you, uh, a nice check to the Lumen organization, and you know, whatever course. Look, if you can't make a pitch when you got the microphone, what the hell, why don't I do that? <laughs> but I mean, these, these to me are the various ways and, and Kid yourself or not, this world is in serious trouble. We live in a very troubled world. We live in a world of disease, of famine. I, I don't know if you saw the other night this piece on Bangladesh where they're taking these ships to destroy them and how these people live and how they, I mean, it's, what, what, it's hopeless for them. It's truly, utterly hopeless for them. And there you go. So every place you look, there's somebody reaching out. There's a crying need. There's a desire. Help me. Help me. And I think if people like us, and, I, and by the way, I am most impressed by the youth in this room today. I must confess to you that I wish that I had a sense of charity and giving at your age that you do. Uh, it came to me, and, and it came to me in a big way, 20 or 25 years ago, but I, I look at people in their 30s and their 40s and I truly admire you because you've got so much more runway that you can do so much more good. It's never too late, don't misunderstand. But I, I, I look at Jimmy Gibbon, who was once my partner and now he's down at Home Depot helping to preserve my estate so I can give more money to charity. <laughs> but uh, I mean it. Uh, I think I think the young people in this world get a bum rap, and especially in America. You look at the Robin Hood organization. To all young people, to all these ultra-rich people that supposedly don't care. I look at Paul Jones. You talk about a hero. There's a hero. The Stan Drucker. I mean, these are guys. They know how to make money, big time. But I think the capacity for giving it away is even bigger, and not because of the money because of the people that are going to be touched on the other side. Writing a check is the easiest thing in the world. Connecting your emotions to that check, to the recipient, that's where the rubber meets the road. So I, I'll, I'll complete my comments by saying to each of you three ways. <clears throat> Talent, treasure, and charity of spirit, kindness. There isn't a person in this room today that can't go outside <clears throat> to the doorman downstairs, have a nice day. Try it. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing how you can brighten somebody's day up. And that's the beginning. You get, you get that thing going, believe me, the force and the power <clears throat> of that kindness goes beyond you, beyond that person. It's passed on. So I, I promise. I think I've, I've lived within my limits, and I'll take some questions about anything you all want to bring up, uh, good or bad. I, I know one thing about these past three years. I don't have to worry about anything coming out of my past because they've drilled down on me for three years. <laughs> and thank God I was too stupid to be smart enough to do something clever, okay, and get in trouble. So 